morning, everyone. Uh, how are you all doing? I hope, actually, good morning to the folks on the West Coast, good afternoon to the folks on the East Coast of the United States. And I don't know where everybody else is from, but hope you are all doing well. I hope you are staying safe. And I hope right now I've got a fun show planned for you because when I was going through ideas for what to cover on today's show, there was just, there was something specific that I was reading all over the place this week on a whole bunch of the websites I follow. And I had to kind of play along here. Let's just jump right into it. Actually, before I jump into it, let me say hi to a few of you in the chat right now. Uh, Sophia is here. Hello, Travis. Oh, and Billy. Billy was saying that he can't be here for the live stream today, so I'm gonna leave this for you, Billy, for when you come back from work later and you watch this. I hope you are staying safe, and I am glad you are still working to make sure your community has the food that you guys need, so job well done to you. All right, let's get into it. Oh, hey, Neil, I see you too, and Steven, you guys are great. All right, the big title topic of today's live stream, of course, is Tiger King, specifically, fan casting a Tiger King movie. I do know that there is that series that Kate McKinnon had signed on for back in, I believe it was November or sometime in the fall of 2019 after the podcast came out. And there's that limited series and Kate McKinnon signed on to play Carol. So I know that's happening, but I still do think that a Tiger King movie is inevitable. So let's fan cast a Tiger King movie right now. I see a whole bunch of you in the live chat making your suggestions, and there are some really, really great ones here. But this was what my mind went to while I was watching Tiger King. The very first person that I thought of when I looked at Joe Exotic was Eddie Izzard. So that was the first person that came to mind. Then I immediately went to Michael Keaton and I was super excited when my good friend Christy Pachko was busy rooting for Michael Keaton to play Joe Exotic. Also, I've seen a lot of people say Matthew McConaughey would be a great pick for the role. I cannot argue with that one either. And also, I believe Thad said this on the Collider video review for the Tiger King series. I think he suggested Sam Rockwell, and I'm of the mind that Sam Rockwell can do just about anything. So I would totally get behind that pick as well. But you know what? If I'm taking into account... I mean, if I'm taking into account ability, I think all of these guys would be capable, but just to narrow it down to one person for, for the role right now, I think I would probably go with Matthew McConaughey just to factor in the business side of it. If you have a Tiger King movie starring Matthew McConaughey, it's gonna draw some attention. So I think I'm gonna settle on him for the Joe Exotic role. All right, let's go down the list here to Carol Baskin. Again, I think the Kate McKinnon pick is a good match there with what they're doing. But a couple other names came to my mind while I was watching the series, three in particular. First, I started to think about Julianne Moore. Also, I was thinking Anne Dowd, who you might be watching in Handmaid's Tale right now, could be a great fit for Carol Baskin and Frances McDormand. And when I want to narrow it down from those three, I don't even, I don't even know what to do. I don't know what to do because I like all three of those options. I think I might lean towards the, I guess the less conventional pick. And I kind of want to just pick Anne Dowd for the role because I think this industry needs more of her. If you haven't seen her performance in Handmaid's Tale, she is phenomenal. And also it's worth checking her out in compliance. She's just so good. So I think I want to go with her. And I know there's a whole bunch of lists out there that do have Julianne Moore on it. And I think she would be great as well. But I'm going to go Anne Dowd for my Carol Baskin. All right, let's keep going down the list. Then, All right, I'm going to package two roles into one. So this is my Walking Dead section of my Tiger King fan casting because Jeff Lowe and Alan Glover, I think are going hand in hand. My Jeff Lowe is Michael Rooker and my Alan Glover is Norman Reedus. So that is who I am picking for those two roles. I think it would be an excellent pairing. Again, both super talented. And I just wanna point out that you know, something feels wrong about surface level casting like this, casting based on looks and, and boxing people into what they've done before. But I don't know, I just really think that the two of them, especially paired together, could really make the most of those roles. So I'm going Michael Rooker for Jeff and Norman Reedus for Alan. All right, let's keep going down the list here. The next one I have is Doc Antle. And 
With this one, I have seen this name thrown around quite a bit, and it's the first name that came to my mind too, so I think it's kind of a no-brainer with this one. I have to go Will Ferrell. There, there's something about them. I think that they just kind of look kind of similar, and even though I don't think Doc Antle would necessarily suit the comedic style that we've seen from Will Ferrell before, I am convinced that Will Ferrell is just a generally talented actor, and I think he could do a lot with that part. The other name that did come to mind was Tim Heidecker, and I still think he could do it, but I'm going with Will Ferrell for this one. Going down the list, my next one is... Uh, Next one here, let's do John first. So I am going to borrow one that I didn't think of myself, but that I caught on somebody else's list. Big round of applause for Chris Evangelista over on Slash Film, because he did a fan casting article, and his choice for this I think is absolutely perfect, Shia LaBeouf. Shia LaBeouf for John. That's it. That is what I'm going with. I am backing Chris's choice for that. But I will say that one other name that crossed my mind, and you'll know why when you hear one of the last stories that I'm going to cover on today's live stream, is Jimmy Tatro. I think that he could also fit that role quite well. I'll get to what I'm talking about as far as uh, Jimmy later on in the show. But if you haven't seen American Vandal, highly recommend that. A great binge watch on Netflix right now. All right. Next up here is my pick for Travis. I've seen a lot of people say Adam Driver for the role. I assume it's the general look, the fact that he's tall, he's got dark hair. My pick for that in a similar vein is Nicholas Braun from uh, Succession. I, I think he is great as Cousin Greg. I also happen to see him in Zola at Sundance this year, and I thought he was great in his role over there. So I think he would make a solid Travis. Dylan is my next pick, and I am patting myself on the back for this one because I'm pretty sure I nailed this casting. My Dylan is Logan Lerman. Hands down, I, like, I don't see any better option for that. He is just the definition of, of a sweet baby face kind of guy. I think that is perfect casting right there. Finally, this is where I'm going to end. I know there's many more characters than what I covered here, but I do want to make sure we talk about other topics today, and then I'll get to some of your suggestions as well. But my pick for James, James Garretston is... I'm a little torn between two. So on Twitter the other day, I saw I saw this person jump in on the suggestion as well. Paul Walter Hauser, who of course was just in Richard Jewell, and we know him from I, Tanya as well. I just want to see more Paul Walter Hauser. So if this is the role that he gets, I'd be happy for it. But another option that did cross my mind was Haley Joel Osment, who I think is doing some great stuff right now. So I would be happy with one or the other, but for the sake of picking one person for, role, for the role right now, I am going with Paul Walter Hauser. All right, let's check in on some of your suggestions before I move on to the next topic. We've got uh, Fillmore Pockets suggesting Michael Rooker or Woody Harrelson for Jeff Lowe. Yeah, I've seen Woody Harrelson's name thrown around quite a bit too. Another great choice. We have, who else do we got here? Nick Cage would kill it. <laughs> I, you know, he might, he might. I think he would be good for that too. I'm, I'm assuming you're, you're saying uh, Nick Cage for Joe Exotic. And I got a lot of faith in Nick Cage to do Nick Cage in any movie, in any role that he wants. Um, so that would be a good one. All right, let us now, all right, I'm gonna get to your live chat questions towards the end of the show. So if there's any questions you guys have that do not pertain to the topic that I'm talking about, save it and I will get to as many as I possibly can before we wrap up the stream. The next thing that I wanna talk to you guys about is something that is a little more serious. I was over on Variety the other day and I was reading an article that's titled, Hollywood's biggest movies are stuck in limbo as start dates remain uncertain. So it, it, was, a, it was an unsettling, upsetting article to read. And I, I do know that shutting down productions is very necessary right now and is for the benefit of the entire world. But you know, it's a scary thing to see an entire industry essentially shut down, like what's happening right now. And I just wanted to read a couple sentences that really kind of caught my eye and stuck with me. Uh, this Variety article is saying that most studios are letting talent and their reps know that at this point they don't expect stalled productions to get back underway until mid-May at the earliest. And originally studios were apparently hinting that April could be a possibility, but now May is is the choice. And even that does feel a little optimistic. You know, I I sit here I sit here and I write for Collider pretty much all day every day, and I'm so thankful for that job because. I don't know, if I didn't have a place to talk about movies and shows and entertainment in general, I, I'd 
would not be in good shape right now and and I love my team at Collider so much but whenever I'm not writing for Collider I am basically sitting there watching the news and I'm hearing all of these these reports and these timetables and it's scary and I I do kind of feel that mid-May might be a little optimistic. You guys know I like to stay hopeful and look on the bright side, but I would rather err on the side of caution right now just to ensure that when production does get underway again, it doesn't wind up being the kind of situation where we could say go right now and then have to reverse that decision and lay low again in the future. So let's just chill out right now, not do any of this work and make sure that we all get past this together. Uh, going on down that article, though, there's also a little bit about accommodating talent that might be involved in productions that were shut down mid-shoot, but that talent has other projects lined up to shoot later on, which could become a major problem. So, you know, let's say you have a certain someone who was working on a movie now and that movie didn't finish shooting. They have to come back and finish that movie. Does that then put another part they had lined up in jeopardy? So I was reading that Variety article and they were saying that the expectation is that in-demand stars, they're gonna be able to convince upcoming productions that they're signed up for to move their start date so that they can finish shooting. This next part is what upset me the most. So they're saying that people in supporting roles, though, who have larger parts in upcoming productions will likely have to drop out. And their insiders are saying that studio executives are already checking in on the availability of other actors who can serve as replacements. So I don't know, I just feel for anyone who is in the position of having a supporting role in a movie that is filming right now and had to stop, and maybe they had a bigger role lined up for the future and they're not gonna be able to do that bigger opportunity because they have to go back to this other movie and they don't necessarily have the weight to push that other shoot date further down the line. So, I don't know. So many people I feel for right now and, and I, I hope it works out for everyone. You know, one of the one of the bright spots in that report was that pre-production on Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness is uh, continuing to do pre-production remotely, and they are still on track to film in June. So I'm just I'm keeping my fingers crossed that that is a reasonable start date for them because I mean I can't wait until we could stop reporting on things being delayed and shut down and we can go back to the positive and be excited about films moving forward again. Um, another thing that they noted, which is pretty obvious, development slates at the studios are also in flux. So another area of this that I feel for is, you know, I'm just making this scenario up, but let's say there is someone who had their first feature lined up somewhere and all the stars had aligned, they finally got their big opportunity and now this all had that come to a screeching halt. I just, I really do hope that some of the bigger players, the bigger studios in the mix here still do honor those scenarios and make those movies happen for those people because, I don't know, just it, it simply breaks my heart to see opportunities taken away from people and I hope that we could overcome it. A really good silver lining in that article though leads to my next topic because in that same piece, they were saying that some folks out there are still taking uh, video and phone meetings in order to move other productions that were scheduled to shoot later on, make those move forward. And one of the ones that they listed that's doing just that right now is apparently George Miller's Furiosa. And what they're saying on that one is Anya Taylor-Joy apparently has met with George Miller for a role in that, and one might assume that a Furiosa movie could be a prequel to what we saw in Mad Max Fury Road, in which case Anya Taylor-Joy would play a young Furiosa, and I mean, Furiosa or not, I don't care what role you give Anya Taylor-Joy, she is going to knock it out of the park. Look at her resume. She has done everything. She is excellent in Split. That's on one end of the spectrum. Then you could take something like Thoroughbreds, which I'm about to bring up again in a moment, and that's on the other end. And then have any of you seen Emma, which you can now get on VOD right now? She is so good. And that is such a specific style of, of tone and pacing and comedy and heart too. The fact that she was able to nail every element of what, make that, what makes that movie work is so important impressive. So I don't care what you give Anya Taylor-Joy, she's going to knock it out of the park. I do hope that this comes together. I'm sure they're talking to other actors for the role, so there is nothing to make me believe that 
at this point in time, she is seriously more likely to get it over somebody else because we don't have any kind of shortlist or anything like that. But the fact that she's meeting for this part, I think, is just a big thumbs up for this project at this point. And, you know, without knowing the other names in the mix, I'm rooting for her to get it. And if she doesn't get this, I just want her to sign up for a million other things in the future. So keeping that in mind, actually, I'm going to pause in my little news rundown right now because... Folks were insisting that I activate the super chat, which I did not know how to do and finally figured out. And we do have a super chat. I see you, Stephen. Stephen Fate is saying, happy Saturday, P. Nimmy. I'm here to support Perry and I hope everyone stays safe in this crazy time. Hashtag super chats for Perry. Stephen has been one of the most supportive people with me doing what I do. And Stephen, just know how much I appreciate you. And also thank you for doing a super chat that wasn't even just for me or to ask a question, but just, you know, keep spreading the word to stay safe. I know it sounds like a, a very simple, basic thing at this point, but the more we say it, maybe the more people will actually do it and then everyone will stay safe and we'll all get through this together. So Stephen, thank you again for your support. All right. So... The reason that I brought up Jimmy Tatro in the Tiger King section and the reason I, or one of the reasons why I brought up the movie Thoroughbreds when talking about Anya Taylor-Joy possibly being in the Furiosa movie is because my next topic here is the new trailer that was just released for the movie Bad Education. So, Bad Education happens to be directed by the director of Thoroughbreds, Corey Finley. And on top of that, I saw this movie at TIFF last year. I was very, very excited to see the movie because the true story that it's based on happened to take place in a school district that was pretty much right next door to mine. We all lived in the same bubble and it also happened to have gone down while I was in high school. So I was very, very aware of this situation. So, you know, when you tell me Corey Finley's directing that version of the story, I just get super interested. And also the, the Jimmy Tatro connection is that he's also in bad education and he plays the son of Alice and Janney's character. But anyway, the basics on this one is, of course, it's based on a true story where Hugh Jackman plays a school superintendent and everybody loves him. Parents love him, teachers love him, the students love him, and under his leadership, that school district basically thrives. It gets bigger and better than it ever has. But then someone uncovers an embezzlement scheme and everything just comes crashing down. It's awful there. And all of this went on while I was kind of living right next door, which was fascinating. But I did see this movie at TIFF last year, and out of TIFF, HBO took the worldwide rights for $20 million, which is quite a bit. Um, the understanding was that they were not going to release it theatrically anyway, and it was only going to be released on HBO, in which case it's something that might have been up for consideration in the Emmy realm rather than Oscars. But this one is now set to arrive on HBO on April 25th, and I can't recommend it enough. Go watch the trailer. The trailer's great, but whether you watch the trailer or not, keep an eye out for this one. This is something that is well worth your time come April 25th. It's, again, a very unique style, tone, and pace, and if you've seen Thoroughbreds, you know that Corey Finley can excel in that respect and make something purely his own. And I think he does that here, obviously with a very strong script and cast around him as well. But he really knocked it out of the park, in my opinion, with this one. It is just, it's got this rip-roaring pace. It keeps you on your toes from start to finish. It's got a great performance from Hugh Jackman, Allison Janney. I'm a big fan of Geraldine Viswanathan right now, and I want to see her do more things. And she's got a great role in this. I, I can't recommend this enough. April 25th, give it a watch, and I hope we can talk more about it here because it, it's a good one, and I'm curious to see how everybody responds to it. But again, it's just in my head. I mean, that happened right down the road, and that was a crazy thing going on. All right, guys, the time has come. I'm saving lots of time for your live chat questions because as much as I want this live stream, and I'm still figuring out the structure here too, so whenever you guys have any feedback, I'm always open to it, but... What I want to do here is, you know, not necessarily make this a full half hour of me spitting news and details at you. I want to have a conversation with you guys. So I'm going to start uh, scrolling through some chats here. Oh, I, every time I need to pop out the chat window. I don't like looking at myself while I do this. All right. So 
Steve Calderon is saying, I love Annie Taylor-Joy, but I still want a Mad Max sequel with Charlize Theron and Tom Hardy returning. I, I hear you on that. I'll never say no to more of those two in the roles, but the, the prequel idea does have more creative possibilities in my mind, and I like the idea of uh, Anya Taylor-Joy being able to step in and kind of make that role something of her own, and I know she has to align with what Charlize Theron started with that character, but the fact of the matter is, if this is truly a prequel, and if she is truly playing Furiosa, you would be going back in time, and you would be seeing what made her into that character, in which case, Mad Max Fury Road was my favorite movie uh, the year it came out, 2015, and if I could take my favorite movie of a particular year and gain new appreciation for it through a prequel movie, I think that would be quite the accomplishment. Oh, so many questions here. All right, this is one from Silas Williams. Hey Perry, do you watch any other movie YouTubers like Beyond the Trailer, Sean Chandler Talks About, John Campy, etc.? Um, I, I scroll around sometimes. To be completely honest, I don't really sit there very often and watch other programming. But if somebody's title catches my eye or, I don't know, I see a, a tweet that catches my eye, I will jump in. Obviously, I do have a, a stronger eye on all the folks that were ever affiliated with Collider from my very first day working with the company where I've worked with some writers who have gone on to become filmmakers. I keep an eye out for their work and all the folks that I know that start their own live streams and YouTube channels. So I am always looking out for them doing good stuff. And, you know, just to name drop uh, two people, Roxy and Darina starting their show. I, I don't know, just when I saw that pop up in my Twitter feed, put a big smile on my face, and I'm so happy for them. But, you know, if you have uh, any YouTubers you think I should check out, I'm more than willing to watch content right now. I love watching what other people are making, especially at home. And I already told you guys this, but I'm also very impressed lately by the creativity on TikTok. I know a lot of it is just people doing the same dance over and over, and I'm still very amused by that. But there are some people out there taking that short-form content, and they're, they're actually using uh using some really uh interesting skills and creating some production value with that and that has been impressing me quite a bit all right did you have a chance to see oh i didn't have a chance to, um mk songbird is asking if i got to see possessor because it was just picked up by neon that is one of my biggest regrets from sundance 2020 is i missed the movie possessor and you guys know how strongly i feel about uh about the company neon i think they make one brilliant decision after the next. Actually, speaking of Neon, I saw somebody else earlier on in the chat, apologies, I cannot scroll back and find this right now, but somebody had asked is Vivarium, which I haven't seen if it's worth your while, or maybe you're gonna, it might have been MK Songbird too, or you're gonna rewatch the Portrait of the Lady, uh, Portrait of a Lady on Fire, which is a Neon movie, and I haven't seen Vivarium, so can't vouch for that one, but I think Portrait of a Lady is worth tons and tons of rewatches, so there's another neon movie for you, but the second I get the opportunity to watch Possessor, you can bet I will. I just heard such crazy things about that one. Going down the list here, we've got another question from Steve. Oh, it just disappeared. No, this one's from Chris. Oh no, here it is. Sorry, Steve. Steve is asking your thoughts on Wonder Brothers moving uh, Wonder Woman 84 to August, and are you surprised they're still keeping Christopher Nolan's Tenet July release? Not, not really on the Tenet question. And I guess, uh, I guess I'm okay with the August release too. It's really difficult to to formulate a an opinion on that matter, just because there's still so much uncertainty on how this is all going to progress. I mean. If you made me guess when this is all going to be over and theaters are up and running and productions are happening again, I maybe would say, yeah, maybe in June. That sounds like a good, but who knows? We don't know. I mean, it, they were saying on the news that they're expecting New York, which is where I am right now, to, to reach the apex within 21 days or something of the sorts. And, you know, then there's hot spots popping up all over the country. We, we just don't know right now. So I think that... If, let's say, August winds up being a safe spot, that could be a good time for Wonder Woman because 
I feel like all the release date calendar hotspots kind of go out the window. I know that August is typically a little bit of a dead zone as far as making the big bucks at the box office goes, but if August is our first big month of movies being up and running in the theater again, that could create new urgency for that month that we usually do not see in a typical year. So it, it could be the right move and I don't know what the what the stats are on how many July releases have moved at this point, but I think it's okay to, to push pause and wait a little bit on that and see what happens. And, oh man, I, I want Tenet to come out in July so badly. I'm so excited for that movie. Okay, let's see what we got here. We have another comment from Stephen Fate. Perry will, oh, I like this one. Perry, will you review books also? I'm really getting into reading now. Also, will you live stream with anyone soon? Collider peeps, smiley face. So I'll answer that second question first. I, I would love to. So if you guys haven't noticed, this live stream thing is very new to me. I'm running the entire thing by myself. I have the software to do it. And again, Thad Williams was a huge, huge help as far as just giving me the 101 so that it looks as professional as I can make it by myself. But in between live streams, I've been doing a little research and, you know, I've been looking up ways to, to kind of build new designs. I've, I've grown a little bit obsessed with this OBS template where you could have it so you guys could see the live chat as it goes by in the video. I don't know. There's all these things that I'm toying around with. And one thing that I really do want to make happen is this live stream happened with another person. So far, I've been able to use the software Ecamm in order to record my Skype sessions with friends to do to do uh, reviews, like what I did with Matt Donato for Tammy and the T-Rex, and what I did with my sister for um, Love is Blind as well. But I haven't quite gained the confidence to make that happen in the live stream format just yet, but I'm working on it. I'm keeping it, uh, I'm keeping it in my mind. And as for book reviews, I would love to do more book reviews. I admittedly haven't been listening to as many audiobooks as I used to, and I think it's because I don't live alone right now, and usually what I do in the morning while I'm getting ready to go to work is I'm blasting my audiobook, so kind of can't do that here right now, but I don't know, maybe even if I don't do another book review, maybe I'll just do some sort of list of books that I recommend, if that's something that you guys are interested in, because most of you know that I've read an extreme amount of Stephen King books, and I can make a long, long list of stuff for you to, go for you to watch. All right, I see a question. I'm going straight for it right now, because Fillmore Pockets is asking, witching hour, Haley Fouch. So, Haley is always welcome on this channel. Haley is always welcome to anything that I'm doing. She is one of my favorite human beings on the face of this planet. But Witching Hour, just in case you guys don't know, Witching Hour is still up and running. We're doing it every single week. So two weeks ago, we weren't able to record video, so we did a pod, just an audio podcast version, but this week we did do video. We made the video work, so you could check that out on the Collider Video YouTube channel, and it was a great, great episode. So I spent a lot of last week working on this utility piece for Collider.com that I'm very proud of, the best slasher movies of the 21st century, and Haley contributed to that as well, and she was just a huge help with uh, getting that off the ground for me but we made an entire witching hour devoted to that topic and talking about that list. So check out the list on collider.com and then also go to the main Collider video YouTube channel and you can watch the video of Haley and I just talking about it. And you can also watch a little clip at the end of me reading the CDB book. I'm curious how many of you know what that is, but just scroll to the end of the witching hour episode. I promise it will amuse you. All right, let's try to get in a few more questions before we got to call it quits, because just so you guys know what I'm up to on a day-to-day -day basis here, I'm doing my very best to create a little bit of routine with what's going on right now. And on Saturdays, what my new schedule is going to be is doing this live stream at 9 a.m. Pacific, uh, noon Eastern, every single Saturday. And what I do after that is the wonderful CrossFit gym that I belong to, they have switched all of their classes to virtual classes on Zoom. And every Saturday in the afternoon, I'm going to jump in and do it. I have been doing early morning classes with them Monday through Friday, but on Saturday they do an afternoon one, and it's, it's making a huge difference for me right now. So they are wonderful, and I'm happy to have them. Let's get this question from Matt Lempick. 
how excited are you for Jurassic World Dominion? So another Collider plug here. We were working on best franchises to binge during, during uh, uh, social distancing. And the two sections that I wrote in that article was one for Paranormal Activity, because I think that Paranormal Activity 1, 2, and 3 are a phenomenal trilogy. I really do think, I think they're great. I'm not just saying, oh, it's great for a found footage movie or it's great for a horror movie. I think that is an exceptionally well-structured trilogy that I would have been betting against all day long, but the way that they, they created a foundation and then built upon that and then merged one and two together in three, I think it was genius. But the other one that I did write about was the Jurassic franchise. And man, it just made me so much more excited than I already was for Jurassic World Dominion. And one of the things that I noticed while I was watching it is, you know how everybody compares Force Awakens and rightly so to A New Hope. I almost feel like the Jurassic franchise is doing a very similar thing where, you know, it's, it's a step ahead though. So Jurassic Park was all about John Hammond's vision coming to life, getting up and running. And of course it stopped short, but you see, you see a glimpse of what it would look like on an operational day of Jurassic Park. Then the first movie of the Jurassic World franchise is them bringing the actual full form park to life. And it basically, they're structured very similarly. Park is running, dinosaurs get out, things go crazy. Then if you compare the lost world to Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, they're both the same in that half of the, roughly half of the movie at least, takes place on an island. And then the other half, or roughly half again, takes place on the mainland. And it also come, becomes largely about the fear that was sparked by the movie that came before them basically transforming from just pure fear to feeling the need to, you know, uh, I'm, I'm looking for a specific word right now, feeling the need to protect the dinosaurs, basically taking responsibility for the mistakes that were made before when the parks actually broke down. So I, I don't hope that's the case. I don't want Dominion to follow the Jurassic Park 3 trend and for those movies to be comparable in that same sense because I think what Jurassic Park 3, and keep in mind, I like Jurassic Park 3, but that is more of like a contained adventure that doesn't really pertain to too many of the themes of the movies that came before. So I wouldn't really want Jurassic World Dominion to do that. So. I, it was just a very interesting thing that I picked up on, but basically what I'm saying right now is go and rewatch the entire Jurassic franchise and then go on over and just sit and wait with me for Jurassic World Dominion and we can theorize and come up with all this fun stuff. Oh my God, it's, I can't believe it's after 12.30 already. This is, this is so much fun. I love doing this with you guys. I can't wait to do more of them. And again, please keep in mind that I am, I'm here to make this conversation happen with you guys. I want this to be something that you guys could look forward to every weekend. So if you have any suggestions, please put them in the comment section below. I check them all the time. So get on that, do some suggestions. I'm here, wide open to them. All right, before we say goodbye, I have one more super chat that I got to get to, and this is from 333 and man. You should check out King Diamond's Abigail. It's a horror story concept metal album. Oh my, I, I don't know what that is, but now that you say it, I will look that up because it sounds super unique and I'm down for any kind of content I can get. Actually, here's a question for you guys, and I'm just gonna leave you with this, and maybe I will talk about it more next week and the week after as well, but who here is interested in Quibi? Do any of you guys plan on signing up for the service? If you plan on signing up for the service, what are the shows that they have coming out that are inspiring you to do so? I'm genuinely curious. I've got my eye on a couple of them. I was a big fan of Punk when it first started, so I'm looking forward to that. I mean, there's a whole bunch of titles in there that do, they've, they've caught my interest, but I'm very curious to know just in general out there who is planning on signing up for Quibi. But I'm gonna leave you guys with that. And again, just a, a big thank you guys for participating in this. Really, I hope this brightens your day, but just notice that being able to spend this time with you guys really does make me happy. And before I go, a lot of you guys were wondering what some of the stuff behind me is. So I'll, I'll tell you one thing at a time and I'm gonna try to point to it. You see this thing in the, whoop, right there, in the frame right there, you know what that is? That is the actual piece of paper that Samuel L. Jackson at the Kingsman Junket wrote 
hold on to your butts. That's the piece of paper that I took to the tattoo shop and got tattooed on me. So that, I figured that was a good one to point out for this uh, Jurassic Heavy episode of my live stream series. So that's it. I'm out of here. I got to go work out now. I hope you guys all have a wonderful weekend. Please stay safe. And I will see you next week for a brand new live stream. Have a good one, guys.